this is the Monday Mindset Podcast, where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 59. And this week, it's Daisy's turn to share something with us. Daisy, what do you have for us? Well, Terry, this is another one of those books. In this case, it's a presentation, which actually is where I started. But one of those books that had quite an impact on me and I've been meaning to share for a while. I have not been able to revisit the book because the book is in storage, but I have revisited the initial presentation, which is on YouTube. And of course, I will share the link. And I think for anyone who suffers from depression, it really is a must watch. It's best part of two hours, but I think you will find that it's two hours well spent to watch it. The guy in question is Stephen Ilardi. He is the Associate Professor of Clinical Psychology at the University of Kansas. And this presentation is on the KU College of Liberal Arts and Sciences channel. And the presentation is called Therapeutic Lifestyle Change for Depression. And he has a book, as I've mentioned, which is called The Depression Cure. And he talks about how we have adapted evolutionary wise particularly in this context, of course, of depression. And he puts up a timeline and talks about how for most of the time that we've been in existence, we have been hunter-gatherers. And that this, of course, is a very different lifestyle from the one that we are used to now, but that actually, for the most part, we are wired uh, to be hunter-gatherers still. There have been moments in our history where we have adapted a little bit and there have been some genetic changes. And he talks about when the agricultural revolution came in and we did change a little bit genetically and we started to become um, lactose tolerant. And so that's over the last 12,000 years. He says the industrial revolution, of course, when we really radically changed the way we live. But the problem, he says, is that we're still wired to be hunter-gatherers. And so there's this mismatch in the modern lives that we lead with the way our brains are working. And he talks about a few examples of this. So he says, what are our natural fears? And he asks people in the audience, you know, think of your children if you have them or think back to when you were a child Uh, you know what were you scared of and children inevitably are scared of being left alone in the dark of being eaten by monsters and he says that these are actually very real they're innate fears and they were there for a very good reason and makes perfect sense in the ancestral environment if you left your young children alone in the dark the chances are that they would be eaten by monsters wild animals and this is one of these examples of a mismatch he says there are things that we want our children to fear but they don't innately have the fear so we have to teach them things like you know running into the road after a football not putting your hand on the hot stove so he says he keeps talking about this mismatch with how our brains are, are actually wired and the mismatch with um, the environment that we're living in now So from an evolutionary timeline point of view, there's been a huge change in a relatively short period of time, but our brains are still calibrated to a different time and a way of life. And some of the key functions of our bodies and brains are still calibrated to this ancestral environment in ways that no longer make sense for our well-being in current times. And the biggest one he talks about, and we've spoken about this before, is the stress response, that fight or flight. This, of course, is when we perceive an imminent physical danger, if you're going back to our hunter-gatherer times. And the stress response serves a a very uh, useful purpose. It prepares you for vigorous physical activity. Problem is, it's very costly to your body, but it's worth it because it's going to get you through this imminent danger. But it's designed for short-term use infrequently, for fairly quick resolution, escape, fight, or die. And so this stress response is adaptive in the short term, 
But he says, and this is what's important, is that it's toxic when it becomes chronic. And modern life tends to keep this stress response high all the time. And he gives some examples of this, uh, interacting with strangers, something that we do often on a daily basis. But he says, you know, back in those times when we were just used to our own tribe, interacting with strangers was usually a stressful situation, potentially quite a dangerous situation. The news of tragedy or something dangerous happening locally, this going back in time, useful information, it potentially imminent danger, something that could be happening, you know, a neighboring um, tribe reported someone was killed by a wild animal, there's a wild animal in the area, well, you know that you potentially you and your tribe are going to be in imminent danger, and you need to prepare for that. So he says our brains are wired to gossip about bad things as if they are personally relevant, because of course, it would have been important. And your life could have been uh, seriously impacted by these local threats. But the problem now is that we're tapped into the global news. So we're getting news of these dangers and tragedies and threats all the time that actually aren't relevant to us, but they feel like they're relevant to us. So they're still having that same or similar anyway impact on our brains and our stress levels. He talks about comparison to others and how we rank amongst our peers. Ancestrally, we would have had far fewer people to compare ourselves to, that we would have had a fewer number of peers. And you would be highly likely, in fact, it would be almost definite that you would be best in your peer group at something. Everyone would know what you were the best at and they would value you for it, you know, whatever that is you know, the best person at figuring out where the water source was, the best person at spearing the fish, the best person at whatever it was, whatever your skill set was, because there are only a certain number of peers, the likelihood is that you'd be the best at some things and you would be highly valued for that. Problem now is that our number of peers is almost infinite. And so we're comparing ourselves to too many people and trying to rank ourselves there. So there's always going to be somebody better than us at anything you can think of. We're connected 24-7 to the internet. And that in itself is stressful. And most of us know that it's, you know, it's quite addictive. If you've ever tried to disconnect from technology for a while, you'll feel that initial withdrawal, but often then there's some relief and you can feel those stress levels lowering. We were never designed for this constant high pace of today's world. And in that same vein, he talks about the huge increase in screen time and the decrease in face-to-face interaction and what impact that has. And so what are some of the outcomes of this chronic stress response? He has quite a worrying list. Depressive illness, brain damage, anxiety, sleep disturbance, both quality and quantity, immune dysregulation. He says, you're, you know, you're much more likely, and I think most of us experience this, more susceptible to illness when you're highly stressed all the time. Inflammation. It's good old inflammatory disorders that uh, anyone in the keto communities and the fasting communities will know all about inflammatory disorders. And many of our biggest killers come back to this problem with chronic inflammation. He goes on to talk a little bit about inflammation. And again, um, he didn't tie it back so much in, but it's this same principle as stress. It's a very important and helpful response very important in acute situations. Just think about a simple inflammatory response when you cut your finger, you know, blood rushes to the area and it gets inflamed and it starts healing. It's a healing response. It's your body's way of healing. The problem is when it goes from being acute to being chronic, much the same as stress. Very important life-saving function we could not do without the inflammatory response, but it's a problem when it's happening all the time. 
And you start getting situations like autoimmune disorders, which is basically an inflammation overload. And he talks about diseases of modernity. She says, what's the common factor with these? High inflammation, obesity, diabetes, atherosclerosis, asthma, fibromyalgia, many forms of cancer, and one that has been fairly recently added, depression. He talks about this as being an inflammation of the brain, fairly recent addition to the list, but very much, he believes anyway, an inflammatory disorder. He goes on to talk about the characteristics of depression. As he's gone a little bit roundabout with these other things, the importance of stress response and, and inflammation. But really, the lecture is about depression. And he says it's a disorder that is so often misunderstood. And he asked people to, in the audience to throw out some ideas about, well, you know, what are the typical misunderstandings? And people will talk about it's, it's part of your personality. You should be able to snap out of it. Surely you can control it. And the very typical all-encompassing one that it equates with sadness. He said, no, but what is it really? He says, it's a debilitating condition that changes the function of your body and your brain. It disrupts your sleep, your energy, your concentration, your memory, your ability to experience pleasure and to work effectively. It says it lights up the brain's pain circuits, but not in normal ways. And many people who suffer from depression look for an escape from this and a relief in some way. And sometimes to the ultimate point of not being able to carry on living with the condition. And he tells the story of someone who went through chemotherapy. I forget the type of cancer they had, but the treatment was chemotherapy. And they talked about the experience and how grueling it was, really, really brutal experience, how everyone rallied round and, you know, was really proud of this guy, of how well he was fighting it. And everyone rallied with their support and their help. And thankfully, he got through it. He spoke also, though, about a period of clinical depression he suffered previously to this. And he said he, as bad as it was and as brutal as it was, he would take the experience of going through chemotherapy over the depression every time. He says that the problem is nobody could see it. Nobody rallied. And people tended to say stupid things like, surely you can just snap out of it. And I remember the first time I watched this presentation, he seems to me like, I know you, you can't necessarily tell just from a presentation, but this guy, Stephen Hilardi, seems like a really nice guy. He has a gentle manner about him. He seems to be very understanding um, about the disorder and it just has a, a good way. He's quite self-deprecating, has a bit of humor, but I very much enjoy watching him. But I remembered as I was watching this presentation again, I sort of got to this point in the presentation where I started to just feel very validated, I guess, very understood. This is something that I've struggled with a lot. And I'd, I'd forgotten this part about you know, telling this story of this guy with cancer. And I've often felt that way. I've often felt that it's much easier when I've had something to be depressed about. I feel guilty. I feel ashamed with trying to explain to people how I feel when I'm depressed. Because the typical question is, what's making you feel that way? How can I help you snap out of it? What can I do to cheer you up? And it's so difficult to explain that it just doesn't work like that. And actually something that adds to the problem is you feel like somebody's died or something awful has happened or something that you would have the right to feel depressed and sad about, except it hasn't happened. <laughs> so you kind of beat yourself up about it because you haven't got a quote unquote valid reason to be depressed. And actually, strangely, it's often a lot easier to feel those feelings when, and I feel awful saying that, but it, 
often feels easier when something bad has happened <laughs> because you can feel those feelings knowing there's a good reason for it, if you know what I mean. So his work is focused around trying to help people with depression. He says, we're in the middle of an epidemic of depression. It's increasing in percentage, generation on generation. And he makes a side note that there has been a significant increase in depression over the last few decades. But at the same time, that there's been a 300% increase in the use of anti-depression medications. So how does that work? <laughs> they don't, he would argue. They do work for some people, but he's much more a fan, as the title of the presentation will give you a clue, in a lifestyle approach to helping with depression. He says one in nine Americans over the age of 12 is taking an antidepressant. And he says they basically just have not lived up to their marketing hype. Beneficial to some and can save lives, but they've not fulfilled that initial promise. And he talks about the Kaluli tribe in Papua New Guinea. And this is something that excited him. An anthropologist went in to assess this tribe for mental illness according to our diagnostic standards. So they're interesting because they're a modern day hunter-gatherer tribe. They do have um, a little bit of agriculture, but Basically, they're like our hunter-gatherer ancestors. They live extremely hard lives, high rates of infant mortality. Uh, they get into fights with neighboring tribes, lots of parasitic illness. They don't have access to um, a lot of our modern medicine and medications. So they basically have very, very tough lives. And he says they, they grieve bereavements with rituals and ceremonies. And so it's not like they don't, experience sadness and difficult feelings but he said what was interesting is that there was no sign of clinical depression which is why when they have so many reasons to be depressed this is goes back to what i was just saying so they've they've got very good reasons to be depressed but there was no sign of clinical depression so what are they doing that we're not doing and he and his team came up with six things that you can do that these groups are doing all the time. Six things, he says, that we can reclaim from the past that can help protect us from depressive illnesses and other inflammatory disorders that can change our brain chemistry more powerfully than any medication and can also change the way our body functions and the way we feel far more powerfully than any chemical intervention. And I was going to make this episode about these six things. But when I watched the presentation again, I got so caught up in this first section and he split the presentation into two sections. And the first was the things I've just covered. I found them so interesting and I thought they were um, important to discuss that I'm going to wait until next time to tell you what the six things are that you can do. So it's a bit of a setting the scene episode um, for the practical tips in the next one. I like the kind of framework of going back and just putting contextual understanding to why we have certain responses. I often use the term pathologizing ourselves. And I think so often we've learned to pathologize ourselves when like you said, there isn't some tragedy that has just occurred and yet someone's feeling debilitatingly depressed or there's not impending doom and yet they're feeling debilitating anxiety in that, you know, maybe we think this about others or we think it about ourselves, but what's wrong? This isn't, it's kind of almost like you said, it's not an allowed feeling. There's not a reason for it. And to really go back in and take kind of a developmental approach to understanding our brain is doing something it was designed to do. Unfortunately, that is mismatched with our current environmental factors or lifestyle things or whatever, I think is so important because that's where the healing and recovery can happen. So I look forward to hearing more about his thoughts on that. But you know, I think you and I 
obviously it's one of the reasons we do this podcast, but to think about lifestyle things to help us not live in a way that is so mismatched Mm. from what our brain is designed to do. Yes, I thought it was interesting and why I wanted to talk about it, like you say, setting up that context. Because it seems so obvious when he, you know, he put the timeline up on a screen and says, you know, this is what we've been doing for this huge period of time. And then in this, this blink of an eye, the changes have been monumental. But our brains just haven't managed to catch up yet. And it was an interesting, and I can't for the life of me remember who spoke about this. And it kind of goes against what he was saying in a way, but it talked actually about depression being useful in a way going back a bit. I don't know about, you know, going all the way back to hunter-gatherer times, whatever, but your body making you feel this depressed and slowing you down, sometimes that there potentially might be a good reason for that in making you maybe become a bit more insular, a bit more staying at home and not doing anything, that that could be a protective mechanism in of itself. Mm -hmm. I I can't remember who spoke about it that way, but it's quite an interesting concept that there could actually be some benefits for the things that your mind makes your body do in that state. Mm -hmm. But for me, overall, it is just this trying to not only try and explain to other people, but to try and justify to myself this feeling like something has happened or and you talked about a feeling of this impending doom and anxiety is something that seems to have I seem to have added into the mix I read that it can happen with menopause um, but it's it's difficult to justify to balance I'm not sure of the word in your own mind how can I feel this way when I haven't got the thing that explains it Yeah, I used to talk about this with clients in that I think oftentimes we have a almost like an equation. We act like these things happen in an equation. When this plus this equals this. Well, if I don't have this, then I can't have the equals this. Mm. And recognizing that these things don't really work in that simplified of an equation. Side note, the other day, I was talking in a group with my work, and a woman was talking about something that had been very difficult for her, but that she was coping quite well with it and feeling quite hopeful and good. And she kept coming back to the thing of saying, now, this is something I should feel depressed about. So again, it's like we have this equation. This is, I don't have a reason I should feel depressed, or I should feel depressed about this that we, again, act as though there's an equation. This event means you should be depressed. Absence of that event means you should not be depressed. And we we just try so hard to oversimplify it, I think. Mm, That's very true. But yeah, so this is something I've been meaning to revisit for a while, actually, just for myself to remind myself of the things he talked about. It's been a long time since I watched the presentation and I read the book, but I do remember it being very helpful. So yes, it was something that I wanted to look at again personally, but then of course it was a great topic to share with you too. So we'll come back to the six things next time. And you know, spoiler alert, they're probably not going to be anything that surprising for most of the people who listen to this podcast, which is one of the reasons why, because actually what I remembered as being part of the thing that was important to me with the presentation and the book was this putting everything in context. And that just for the way my brain works anyway, understanding how and why things work and putting yourself within that context and just kind of make sense of everything I anyway find really helpful. So that's why I spent some time sharing the first part today. Very good. Well, I'm sure like me, everyone will look forward to hearing more next time about the lifestyle things we can do to help 
navigate this differently. So in the meantime, I hope you have a very wonderful week. Bye, everybody. Bye.